knows some of those kids walking out the door could be doing communion one day, huh? How about our young men this morning? Great job. The calendar has flipped, and just like that, it's the first Sunday of May. We continue on our slow roll through the book of Luke, and today's text, Jesus is no longer dealing with the 72 disciples. We find Jesus in a discussion with a lawyer at the start of our text. So this morning, I would like to uh, introduce Brother Ray Tessinari, the Tessas, Tessas, Tessinari, Ray Tessinari, up to read the text. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. T. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Good morning. Good morning. On one, uh, Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Luke 10, 25-37. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> He's got a fan club. You should, you should see this man with trail life. Yep, he's awesome. Heavenly Father, as we spend the next few minutes in your word this morning, may none of us leave here the same as we walked in because we heard from you this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to be together. And I praise you and I thank you, Heavenly Father, for who you are in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at the first couple of verses, verses 25 to 29. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? It is not uncommon for rabbis and Jewish leaders to be in the forefront of the temple or in a public area discussing matters. Okay? So this is not an unusual thing. This was a normal occurrence in their culture to be having these public debates. This is the backdrop on which Jesus stepped up to engage the conversation. So now we have this conversation between Jesus and this lawyer. Back in the day, they were called scribes. So when you're in the scriptures and you see the word scribe, it literally means lawyer. They, this was a lawyer. These men were men who knew the law, who studied the law. Our now, nowadays, we call them lawyers. 
This lawyer who challenged Jesus was an expert in the law, and he was trying to trip Jesus up with his question. He was trying to trip him up. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Just wanted to stop here for a second and explain what eternal life is. Okay? We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but eternal life is those that give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That you pray and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. And let me give you a little scripture back up about eternal life. John chapter 17, verses 2 to 4. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. The only way to eternal life is through Jesus Christ. Now that's a fact. That's the truth. And I know that the world wants everyone to believe that there are different ways and that all ways lead to Jesus. I am telling you right now that only one way that leads to God and that is through Jesus Christ. There is no other religion, no other whatever that's going to make you holy other than the Holy Spirit from the Scriptures, from the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way to God. People don't like to hear that. They call Christians, they say, yeah, you guys are narrow. Yeah, I am on that point. I'm narrow on the point of salvation and who Jesus Christ is. Now, the areas that I'm not narrow on, are you a Pepsi person or a Coke person? Are you a Patriots fan or a Ravens fan? Now, I'm not narrow on that. But I am certainly narrow on who the Savior is. Okay? Let's not get that twisted. Being a Christian, if that's someone's definition, that you're so narrow, fine. You know what? Love it. Love it. Because you're going to find out today what it actually means to love it. You're going to find out today what it actually means to stand strong in who you are as a Christian and being in Christ on this earth. You're going to find that out today, just how valuable it is. One more proof text, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Drop the mic. Let's move on. Don't miss this, saints. Based on the lawyer's question, he was implying eternal life could be earned by good deeds. What must I do? What must I do to receive eternal life? In other words, a works-based concept of receiving eternal life. You cannot work hard enough to receive eternal life. It is given by the grace of God. That is why we have eternal life. You can't be rich enough or poor enough. You can't be dark enough or light enough. That isn't how you receive eternal life. Receiving eternal life is understanding and asking the Lord Jesus Christ for Savior because you know that you're a sinner and each and every one of you looking at me, either in cyberspace or in these chairs, these pews this morning, we were born into sin. We have all of that the same. Every last human being. We need the Savior. But I want to follow the conversation here. Let's follow the conversation. Teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asks, what is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? The lawyer answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered correct correctly, do this, do this, and you will live. 
this scribe knew the Bible. You see, lawyers had to study the Old Testament. He was quoting, this lawyer was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. This lawyer was quoting, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. He also knew the verse in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 8. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. He knew the scriptures. What he didn't know was grace. The concept of inheritance not only seems not only means entering heaven, heaven by faith in Christ alone, but receiving rewards and the quality of life that comes from following Christ. You know, I think I've said it since I've been here three, two or three, maybe four times, we're going to get to what crowns are and what happens in heaven and who gets rewarded. And let me tell you what happened. As I was studying the text this week, and as I was going through and I... You know, I, I use three or four different Bibles and, and, and different things, whatever. And, and so as I'm going through, it became powerfully clear that I needed to stop saying we're going to get to it and do it this morning. So this morning, we're going to do a sidebar. We're going to step away from the text, which means we're going to get to, we're going to get to um, Jesus in, in, in the rest of the text a week after next because next Sunday is Mother's Day so we're going to get to the Good Samaritan the weekend of the 19th okay because I want to spend time with this because I want every single person here in my voice to understand what is waiting for you in glory what is waiting for you in glory what is your inheritance and when you get the inheritance what do you do with that inheritance so we're going to tackle that this morning the great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, he's another one of the guys you find some books in my house, Charles Spurgeon, he was born 1834 and he died 1892. He said this about crowns. This is from Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher. There are no crown wearers in heaven who were not cross bearers below. <laughs> Think about that. There are no crown bearers in heaven who were not cross bearers here below. That had me spinning because that's a, that right there is a sermon altogether for people like myself who read that and just go off. Believers are eternally rewarded by Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ with rewards for being faithful. There are rewards for each and every Christian being faithful. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You will suffer loss or gain. But as a Christian, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. So that's the first aha for every single Christian. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and he indwelled his Holy Spirit in your body, he didn't do it so that you can have the box checked. He did it because he wants you to live righteously in him, and according to how he gifted you, he wants you to get busy for his holiness. So let me explain. So the question then becomes, what are the crowns and rewards? 
Scripture talks about five different crowns and rewards. Five different crowns and rewards. What Jesus said about crowns. Revelation 3, 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Hold fast to what you have, so no one will take your crown. Crown number one. Now, these are just my order, okay? This is no particular order. This is just what I ordered, how I wrote it. Crown number one, the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness. Running the race of faith, pursuing God's plan for your life. Longing for Jesus' appearance. In other words, you become a Christian, and you're dealing, and you're trying to live, and you're trying to grow in, your, in who you are in Christ, and you're reading your Bible, and you're trying to stay faithful, and the world is beating up on you, and you are, you are there, and you say, I'm not giving up, I'm not giving up, because I know the Lord is coming. That is the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy, verse 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. 2 Timothy 4, 8. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearance. Come on, Jesus, come on. If that's one of your favorite songs, if you're humming about, I'm going to see heaven soon, if you're humming these old hymns about Jesus coming, that means that that is the crown of righteousness. Crown number two. The incorruptible, incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. Disciplined, self-controlled. Okay, I said before when we started today, this morning, that straight and narrow, and I'd rather be on that straight and narrow and have the world call me all the names in the world, well, guess what? You are rewarded for it. You are rewarded for walking in righteousness. You are rewarded for living a biblical life. You are rewarded for not going to what the world says you should do. You are rewarded Discipline, self-controlled life. That's what a Christian is supposed to have. A disciplined, controlled life. By the way, don't get it twisted. You can have a disciplined, controlled life and whatever the Lord calls you to do. If you're a plumber, if you're a doctor, if you're an electrician, if you're an engineer, if you're a lawyer, if you're a nurse, if you're a street sweeper, if you work at McDonald's, you are called to live a disciplined, controlled life. That is the incorruptible crown. Second, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 to 27. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No! I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. There is a crown for living a disciplined, Christ-centered life. Now, here's the thing. When people hear that, they immediately think in world views, which we're going to get to later on this year. Have you ever gone to a men's retreat? True, most women haven't gone to a men's retreat. But a woman's retreat, there is a high time in the Lord you want to tell me that you didn't have a good time with the brothers and sisters you were there with? You may have gone with a few brothers and sisters, and then you met some people on the way, you met some people during the weekend, and you had a high time in the Lord. Maybe there were times in that weekend that the Lord became so real to you that it was time for you to start dealing with the sin that was stopping you from progressing in your faith and in your holiness. 
and now it's time to stop it. Retreats have a great way of doing that. Do you want to move forward in your faith? You need to put down what's been ailing you. Disciplined, faithful life gets you a crown. It does. I just read you the scripture. Crown number three. The crown of life. Endure patiently through trials and those who died for the causes of Christ. So you're here. So some of you, we, someone could be dealing with cancer. Someone could be dealing with heart issues. We got all kinds of medical issues. I think I shared with you before. I was skippy in my health until about 45. I went to the doctors one time a year for that yearly checkup only because my employer said that you have to get a yearly checkup. That doesn't mean I was totally healthy, but I had a little cold, no big deal. I turned 55. I all of a sudden picked up a cardiologist. I picked up a, a podiatrist. I picked up another, all these specialists. And then going to the eye doctors wasn't just to get new glasses anymore. I was like, what is going on? And then I remembered what the scripture says, that every day we grow older. It's going to happen to all of us. It's going to happen to all of us. These bodies wear out because they're not going to last forever. Our holy bodies in heaven is going to last. But these bodies break down every day. Some of them break down earlier than we anticipate. Some of them are breaking down right now. If your body hasn't been broken yet, don't worry about it. It's coming. There is something coming for you. Don't worry about it. So the crown of life, endure. Now these are for trials. These are for trials. For people who died for the causes of Christ. You can think of what's happening in our world today and those innocent people that were taken hostage. Some of them may have been Christians and they are there dying for the causes of Christ. There are people in third world countries who are standing up because the country believes in a whole different cult or a whole different faith. And because they are walking that narrow road of righteousness, that they're in jail or they're in prison or they're being persecuted. Well, they gonna, they're going to get the crown of life. Let me give you the proof test for the crown of life. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed are the one... Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because of having stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. You work in a place where being a Christian is kind of a bad thing, and you may hear whispers in the background of people leave little things on the desk trying to mock you. Every time that happens, you say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because there's going to be a point where they're going to ask you to pray for them. Something's going to go down in their life where there's only one person in all this whole place where you work that they can trust. And they're going to ask you, can I talk to you? And then that is where the Lord has you on display to lead them to the throne of Christ. That is why you are working and going to school and where you live your life. You may be retired and you go to different places. That is one of the reasons why you are there. Because if you are living the straight and narrow path of Christ and Christianity, you will stick out. You will. Don't worry about it. But pastor, I'm shy. No problem. You're going to stick out. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and will suffer persecution for 10 years. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give your life 
as your victor's crown. Mm. Wow. Crown number four, the crown of glory. The crown of glory. This crown is for pastors and Christian leaders. This is the crown of glory. You know, years ago when I started pastoring and I was the associate pastor for Pastor Dennis, I used to think it was a pain until I had the first lunch with these brothers. I was asked to go to lunch with all these senior pastors and I was the only associate pastor. And that when I went the first time, I never missed another one. These brothers were so full of wisdom, they made me understand as this young assistant or associate pastor trying to get through seminary, that when the Lord calls you to pastor and you're the under-shepherd, that it is the most and the biggest job that any one man can have. And it's not based on the size of your congregation. God does not base his servants, his under-shepherds, on the sides of the congregation. God based that pastor on the holiness of the pastor. If you're leading 10 people or 10,000 people. And these senior brothers, and all of them pastored for years. I, I, think, I think Pastor Dennis was the youngest one, and he had 20 years in as a senior pastor, or as a pastor, over 20-some-odd years. And all I did, now if you can believe this, I sat with these four or five brothers and I ate and listened. I talked very little. I would ask a question and then they would hop on it. And when they hopped on it, they always hopped on it with the scripture to back up on the understanding. And I just sat there and I was just eating it up from these brothers. They were amazing. The crown of glory is for godly leaders who are examples to the flock. Here's what the scriptures say. 1 Peter 5, verses 2 to 4. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. So God wants you to be not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Now here's the part that just... When these guys said this, because all of them, all of them had a fear that we wouldn't finish strong. That was the fear that drove them, that they wouldn't finish strong. Here's that verse. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. A pastor that loves the Lord and loves his flock, we live by this. That's the crown for the pastors and the le Christian leaders in the church. Crown number five, the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing is the crown of soul winning. Soul winning. Oh, does that mean... Because I'm not like you, I can't evangelize? Not at all. Not at all. So what is soul winning? Soul winning is sharing the gospel with someone and they becoming a Christian. Maybe not in front of you. Don't forget, when we are sharing Christ, we are either watering the seed or planting it. Watering it or planting it. If the Lord allows you to lead someone to Christ, walk through them through the prayer of salvation, that's because the Lord allowed you to do that because that person is ready. Not because you planted the seed or because you watered it. But you had a role in that brother or sister coming to Christ. You invite your neighbor to church. They're not, they're unchurched. You invite them to VBS. Their kids come to VBS. The kids have a wonderful time. 
the mom realizes that I should be having my kids do something on Sunday. So they start coming to Sunday school. She starts coming with them. Mom gets saved. Mom starts going to the woman's Bible study. Two or three years pass. Dad walks in the door. Dad sees brothers in the church. There are men here? I was one of those guys. That's why I can say that. And he gets to know some of the brothers. And he realizes that the brothers are just like him. Just like him. He starts getting to know people. He starts coming to church. He hears the gospel. Then he gets saved. You asked his family to come to church eight years ago. What do you think you're going to get? Sharing your faith can mean sharing Christ if the opportunity is allowed or inviting them to church. Maybe this same family that you have to invite need a ride. That means you've got to come up with a plan to bring them to church. So what? A crown for soul winning. Each and every Christian, each and every Christian, here's what the scripture says. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. For what is hope or joy or crown of righteousness? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Share the gospel. Here's an Old Testament text that I thought was quite interesting. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness lead to righteousness. Our church services at 1030. I walk chapel two to three, four times a day when I'm here, Monday through Thursday. And there's always people on the corner of our parking lot. I have stopped and talked to every last one of them. They now call me Pastor Larry. There's two ladies that come in two different cars and sit in one car with two dogs. And as I walk over, I tested them last week. I said, so I've invited you to church before, right? Yes, Pastor, 1030. I just want to make sure you knew. And I keep on walking. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars are, like the stars forever and ever. Invite people to church. Don't worry about it. Some interesting facts about crowns that the believers receive. Here's a couple of interesting facts. Our crowns will be cast down before Jesus' throne. So when we get to glory, now I want you to imagine this, because I, you know, I imagine this all the time. I, I imagine being in front of, that, the, of Christ. And we have these crowns. I mean, think of someone like Billy Graham. How many crowns do you think that brother has? Okay, seriously. Someone like Mother Teresa. How many crowns do you think that sister has? Here's what's going to happen when we get our crowns. Here's what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 4, verse 9 through 11. Whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before him who sat on the throne and worshipped him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying... You are worthy, O oh Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The crowns that you receive for doing and living the life that you live here on earth, when we get in front of the throne, we're going to hand those crowns back to Jesus at his feet. Man. That, that just gets me rolling in, internally. Think about that. Think about that. We're going to give those crowns back to Christ. The 
The crowns are real. The crowns are real. Revelation chapter 4, verse 4. Revelation 4, verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. Crowns of gold on their head. Crowns can be lost when good deeds are done with wrong motives. You can lose crowns for thinking you have a works-based salvation. When you do something that the Lord tells you to do, you need to do it quietly, silently, do it. You do not bring attention to yourself. Remember the scripture where Jesus was yelling at the Pharisees who pray in the open feet, in the open corners and want people to say, oh, how holy they are. No, no, no. Scripture tells us that when you look for praise here on earth, you've received your crown on earth. In other words, it's going to be burnt up with the earth. Let me show you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues on the streets, and, do, and be honored by others. To be honored by others. Here's, now listen to the last part of this. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So now I ask you, do you want your crown now or later? Do you want your crown now or later? Do you want it now or later? You see, if you have it now, it doesn't last forever. If you have it later, it lasts forever. Crowns must be guarded against deceivers and spiritual deception. You must guard who you are in Christ against deceivers. They're in the world today. They're in the world today. Look at what's happening in our news today. Look at what's happening in our political environment. We got issues. We got issues. Do you want to lose crowns over it? Here's what this text says. 2 John 1, verses 7 and 8. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as, as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but, you, but that you may be rewarded fully. Do not lose your crowns getting tied up in the world's mess. Do what you're supposed to do from a biblical standpoint. The world is not perfect. It is not our political system is not perfect. Democrats are a mess. Republicans are a mess. That is no joke. That is no lie. Our democracy demands that we vote our leaders in. Stand on righteousness with whoever you vote for as close as you can get to it. Okay? Let's move on. Please rise for your walking away thought. The lawyer in today's text knew the Old Testament scriptures concerning the laws of God, but needed some understanding about the inheritance of eternal life. He didn't understand grace. One can't earn you, one can't earn your way into heaven. The concept of inheritance not only means entering heaven by faith in Christ alone, but receiving rewards and quality of life that comes from following Christ. Following Christ is everything. That's how I live my life. Following Christ is everything. 
It's my prayer that the believers got a deeper understanding of the crowns and rewards to encourage us how to live in today that will make a difference for you in glory. How you live your life today as a Christian will make all the difference to you in glory. In glory. In two weeks, we'll pick up what's left and explore Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. And I put this in here because I want to make sure, because as a man who's been married for 37 years, I did blow this one year. Okay? It wasn't until the kids reminded me that tomorrow's Mother's Day, Dad, and it was Saturday. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. However you celebrate it. Many of us know that our mothers are with the Lord, but our wives are mothers. If your wife is not a mother, you know some mothers, and I know some brothers who don't have children who give and celebrate Mother's Day with their wife anyways. So I'm just putting it out there on Front Street. That every man hearing my voice, hearing on Cypress Space, if you blow it next Sunday, you are on your own. You receive fair warning. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the scriptures this morning. I praise you for a deeper understanding, Heavenly Father, of crowns that each and every one of us are in line for. And I pray, Heavenly Father, as we live our life, Heavenly Father, that we live a life gaining more crowns and not losing them. Help us, Heavenly Father, and I pray if anyone made a decision for Jesus Christ this morning, that you so bless them and that they step forward with someone in the church or me at the door so that we can get more information to them to help them with their journey. In Jesus' name, amen.